Hey guys, this is Hamdi Jassim, author of The Terrorist Whisperer and host of The Black Side Show. In today's episode, we bring you codename AAA. Not your average IT, but the most dangerous IT in the world. Once being investigated by the US government, was hired by a DOD recruiter to go to Iraq and set up all internet satellite for the first time. His hacking skills didn't only save American lives, but it was able to change the course of history in the Iraq war. If you like our show, make sure you like and subscribe and make sure you follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Enjoy the show. And this is not your an average IT. This is the, really the most dangerous IT in Iraq during my time. Yeah, that's exactly what somebody with the CIA would say. I know my, my demands are this. I have three liters of vodka. I want an AT4 for each liter. Oh, Woo! Oh, They just didn't realize the person across the line was more dangerous than they are. <laughs> right. They'll be like, knock, knock, you know, there's the SF guys outside. <laughs> right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Black Side Show in episode 16 today. And today is a really, really crazy story. Today, I've brought you one of my good friends that I served with. We call him the Iraqi tribal leader, Triple A, the craziest American I ever met my whole entire life. He was a security, not a security contract. He was an IT contractor that gets sent to Iraq. And then we're going to go in depth about his story. This was, this was actually one of the best ITs that I have ever met in my life that understand how things work. He's been in IT for about 27 years. And this is not your an average IT. This is the, really the most dangerous IT in Iraq during my time in Iraq during the war. He's, I don't know how to describe him today. Um, Triple A, in my opinion, was the equivalent of Johnny Knoxville from Jackass. This is literally the craziest American I have ever worked with. Perhaps I wasn't really afraid of my enemy as much as they were going to kill me. I was afraid of this guy was going to get me killed because he's crazy and nuts. So again, Triple A, Harun, as we call you in Iraq, welcome to the Black Side Show. Hey, man, it's good to be on the show. Uh, with an introduction like that, I don't know whether to be offended or, you know, uh, I don't know. Hey, man. That's <laughs> I, know, I know you are completely a different person today than you were back right. in the day. I don't know who pissed you off back in the day, but I paid for it. But anyway, everybody, everybody did pay for it. <laughs> I mean, dude, I am inspired by your story. And I know that like the, the audience really have no idea what they're about to get into. The things that you got into during the Iraq war, the things you're exposed to, the things you witness during your time was, were probably the craziest things I've ever witnessed, right? There is really no one other than some agency guys three-letter agency guys, would have been in the level that you were in when the Iraq war started. So I want to go back to the beginning, man. You were, once in your life, one of the biggest threat as an IT to the United States government, perhaps. Yeah, well, I don't know about a threat to the, <clears throat> to the government. Uh, you know, everybody, especially at the MOD, where I eventually ended up, had their own agendas and, you know, different... Yeah objectives they were trying to further and uh i mean it was really like the thing i can equate it to is almost like a game of thrones uh, a lot of backstabbing a lot of people getting killed uh a lot of political stuff so um uh, yeah it uh you know i tried to serve our country and our missions well i especially serve the iraqi people um i developed a love for the, the country of Iraq and also the people there after being there just, you know, six months. Uh, so yeah, it was an experience that, I mean, I, I consider myself a high mileage individual at this point, you know, Iraq is yeah. hard all the time and uh, hard on you, as you know. And um, yeah, it, it seems like lifetimes ago, like ancient history. Right. Um, but I mean, it I is. think it's been 14 years since I was there last. So yeah. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a crazy, it was almost five years from 2003 to 2008. Um, yeah. very, very, you're, very you're interesting the only time. American I literally can refer to that actually witnessed the whole five years war with me. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, a lot of people are come and go, you know, they, they, they yeah. come in and they do their rotation army, you know, like, what is it like a year or so? Uh, yeah. Some, you know, air force is like six, eight months, something like that. Uh, so just as people are starting to get acclimated and develop those relationships, yeah. uh, make those connections, uh, you know, learn the whole cultural thing and get that figured out nuance there, they leave. And there's very little continuity. And then they've got a fresh set of guys that come in and they have to basically start over. Um, so that was, that was good to be there throughout all that. And I did my part to try and uh, help these guys, especially at the MOD, uh, with you know, transitioning between different groups that were coming in and going out off uh, deployment. But uh, it was something that I never planned on yeah. or never even thought about you know, getting involved in. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm, what, like 26? It's 2003. I'm in New Orleans. Uh, I was a regional manager with House of Blues. Uh, IT manager. And so I had four venues, uh, New Orleans, Chicago, Myrtle Beach, and Orlando. And it was a great job, especially for a young guy, young single guy. Um, You know, all the shows you want, uh, you know, all the booze you could drink and uh, just get free tickets to anything and, and so on. So uh, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, then to go to something like Iraq was, was, was quite a change uh, for sure. So, um, I mean, your it, bond with us, bro, your bond with us Iraqis, it was insane, right? Like I have read books about, I've read like American Spartan about this guy that invented with the Afghans for, you know, a year or two. Uh, there's a lot of public stories about, you know, how people uh, like, you know, what Caucasian Americans bond with other nations. I think people in America don't realize the way you bonded with us that, you bonded with Iraqis more than I ever did as, as a native person, <laughs> you know, like you were the go-to guy. Um, they didn't consider you a, a stranger to the country. You were pretty much like part of the country. And uh, then they started calling you Sheikh Haroon, like the tribal leader and the, the, the things. And, you know, uh, you know, before we go back to how this started, um, you know, dude, like people don't realize, like you, I, I was doing undercover work at the time in the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, working for the agency guys, collecting information. You were somebody not just in my work environment. You were like my buddy. You were the guy that I would go fuck shit up with, that I would go hang out with and do crazy things with. And uh, your presence in Iraq was just fucking entertainment, bro. Like it was just super fucking cool. We all had fun. We all enjoyed your company. And there's not one day in our lives we woke up without you putting a smile in someone's face. So going back to how I want to get the audience to really understand how this is all started. And I didn't joke when I say this is the equivalent of Johnny Knoxville from Jackass because everything you're about to hear now and what you're about to hear is going to blow your mind. And by the way, these are not just stories that we're telling you today. These are stories been filmed and recorded by you. And we have all this footage and we're going to share it with you. Uh, and back to your story. So you're back in New Orleans starting all over again. Yeah, if I may, uh, like, I, I like the Johnny Knoxville reference, but I, I could maybe frame it another way. It's, it's Johnny yeah. Knoxville meets Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, yeah and you know it wasn't the, the reason i was able to bond so well uh with the yeah. people there is because of the hospitality and the graciousness and the open arms that i was received with so yeah. uh i mean the, the iraqi people were nothing but good to me while i was there and uh i mean from early on were, we're telling me hey you know you're you're like family and you're like family and uh and they really did and they they treated me like family uh I slept at their houses. I ate, you know, good friend of mine, yeah. Shauki, his mom cooked for us while we were at the MOD every yeah. week. She'd yeah. bring in food. Um, so, yeah, I was treated really well. Uh, and, and that, you know, made things a lot easier on everybody in, in a bad situation. You know, we, we made the best of a, of a tough situation. And there's nothing wrong with having a little fun in a, in a bad situation. Uh, Absolutely. Just to kind of keep it light, keep your head on straight, you know. Dude, the humor really what got us by back then. I mean, right. all the craziest shit that we went through during that war times and 
I, I can tell you, man, like when I talk about it, I, I remember the situations we've been through. I remember all the good things and the laughs and the thing. I mean, that's how you really get through war. So sure. I want to take you back to before you even arrived in Iraq, before you even knew what Iraq was going on, what the war was going on, who were you prior to all this Iraq showing up in Iraq in the middle of a, of the, in the middle of a combat zone? Yeah, it was, uh, it was really interesting the way that came about. Uh, it was like something like many things in my life out of a movie. Um, it was really, really bizarre. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I was with house of blues and then, uh, I was, uh, throwing raves with a buddy, which are these, these parties, basically these big parties and a, and a big opera house in new Orleans, uh, you know, every once a month, maybe twice a month. And at any party, there could be five, 6,000 people there, DJs from all over the world. Um, I had, you know, hair, not, not quite to my ass, but like down my back, um, you know, party hardy, uh, just, just living it up being young and single you know, and, uh, and, and living that life. It was, it was a, a rock star life. Uh, so, you know, everything's cooking along. I think in, it was in March, uh, late March of 03, uh, things cook off in Iraq. And, uh, you know, I, I kept myself informed on, on international affairs and, and different things like that. So I was really intrigued, uh, about what was happening uh, over there, but, you know, had no interest in, in going to work there. Uh, I've never, you know, worked with the government before at this point. Uh, so yeah, it just something I never really considered. And so, uh, one morning, uh, it was a Monday morning, uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I hadn't woke up yet. Uh, I didn't have to be at work till nine. So I you know, slept in a little bit. Uh, my phone, my old landline phone is just ringing off the hook and ring and ring and ring and ring and ring and, and it'll stop, you know, eventually. And then this ring and ring and ring and ring and ring and again. And I'm like, man, who's trying to get a hold of me at this time. So I pick up the phone. I'm like, Hey, what? And, uh, this guy was on the line. He said, uh, Mr. Aubrey, I'm, and I, I can't remember his name now. Uh, so-and-so with, uh, a, a recruiter, uh, calling on behalf of the United States department of defense regarding a project and opportunities for you in Iraq. And, you know, I don't want to repeat what I said here, but it, it wasn't good. I was like, you know, who yeah. are you? Like, what are you doing playing on my phone? At, you know, Monday morning, like, at the, you know, prank call. You got nothing better to do. You're a loser. Like, blah, 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 blah. And hung up on him. Like, man. So the phone rang immediately again. And so now I'm ready to give it to him. I'm like, all right, you're going to have it. So I pick it up and the guy immediately starts talking. This time is a different tone. He's like, uh, hey, look, uh, I'm talking. And you're listening. And so this is not a print call. Uh, this is, uh, I'm a recruiter uh, for this project with the Department of Defense in Iraq. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about it now. And, you know, you can, you can make your decision or whatever later, but we're going to talk about this right now. Can I have a few moments of your time? So, but sure. So uh, he began describing uh, what I would later know to be is the uh, CEA project or captured enemy ammunition project. And that project was tasked with uh, from, you know, from the Kuwaiti border all the way up, you know, north, uh, northern Iraq near the Turkish border, securing all of Saddam's uh, weapon sites, uh, securing those sites, inventorying everything there, and then uh, running demo or, or blowing up um, 100 tons a day, six days a week of the munitions that couldn't be repurposed for the Iraqi military. So uh, I thought, you know, that's interesting. What does that have to do with IT? And, you know, he told me, well, we need uh, a country manager for, for South and South Central Iraq. So everything from uh, Baghdad to Zubair, you know, which is down there by, the, by Basra, by the Kuwaiti border. And we need to establish communications at these bases because you know, all the fiber optics were blown up in the shock and all campaign. Uh, there's no real telecommunications infrastructure. So we need to go down there and, and all these bases set up, uh, you know, satellite communications, uh, VoIP phones, you know, HF radios, uh, the works. I mean, they, these places basically had to be built from the ground up. Uh, so, you know, it was right around the time uh, where that first, there was that first contractor that got killed. I don't know if you remember. And, and uh, 
about mid 2003, he was living, I think he was living in Karata. So like just outside the green zone. Um, and you know, I mean, at the time I was thinking, well, the guy got his head cut off. Um, the only beheading video I've ever seen, and I will never not watch another one again. Like it's just, it's horrific. Uh, but I thought, well, you know, what kind of idiot goes out to the green zone, you know, by himself, you know? So, I mean, not to sound cold, but I guess, you know, you, you play stupid games, you know, win stupid prizes kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I was concerned about that. So I, I told the guy, I was like, so, Hey, aren't they like cutting people's heads off over there or something? And, of course, he framed it differently. He's like, oh, you know, Mr. Uh, well, you know, triple A. Um, <laughs> he yeah, said, he uh, has, you know, it's, it, no it, it's, it's right for you to be, you know, uh, concerned about the security situation. Um, but, uh, you know, just to let you know, you'll be rolling with uh, a PSD of, of, of PMCs, you know, so basically, you know, a bunch of mercenaries. Uh, uh, from U.S. And, and British and South African and Australian special forces, you know, men from all over the world. Uh, you know, you'll be armed as well. Uh, you're going to have, you know, body armor, the full kit, armored vehicles, you name it. So don't even worry about that. You're going to be just fine. You know, and it, that, that that shouldn't be a real, a real big concern. You're going to be in good hands. And so I'm thinking Why about it. Why do you think they gave you that call specifically? I don't know. I, I really don't know to this day that there's, uh, I have a couple of theories. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, because they got, they got to see you somewhere in the system. Like these individuals, right. you know, might come out as recruiters. They may come up as a project managers of some DOD, blah, blah, blah. And you really never know who they really work for. You really never know who these individuals are. So, in order for them to pick you up and, and, you know, being someone that worked in the intelligence sector, knowing all these mind games and everything, where did you think these people saw you and figured that you would be the right candidate for this program? So there's, there's two theories that I have. I've never been able to prove either one. But um, when I was at, uh, in high school, I uh, applied to go to West Point. I wanted to be, you know, a lifelong you know, military uh, professional uh, soldier. And uh, so I applied for West Point. I applied to the Air Force Academy. Um, my scores were good enough to get into West Point, but Air Force Academy, my math was a little too low on my ACT. And so uh, the Air Force, and that's really what I wanted, I wanted to be a pilot. And so um, Air Force came back and said, look, we'll give you a full scholarship to whatever college you want to go to. And we'll pay for everything and, you know, room, board, all that, books, uniforms, everything. All you have to do is show up. And so um, I went, I went to Air Force route and, and part of the conditions of, of getting that scholarship was that you had to join uh, the Air Force Reserves. So I was 18, I joined the Air Force Reserves, but they, I didn't go to boot camp. They put that off and they put you in an ROTC program at the university of your choice. And so, um, you know, I, I had drill, I had, uh, you know, PT, uh, I had military science classes, everything, but, but no boot camp yet, camp yet. That was reserved for between your um, sophomore and junior year. And so when it came time for boot camp, they run you through uh, a series of, of medical tests and the review board came back and, and said I had hyperthyroidism and that um, it wasn't going to work. That I couldn't even be enlisted that, you know, we're sorry, but you can't be an officer. You can't get your commission. And that really was devastating at the time because I didn't know what else I was going to do with my life. I just was, was shocked. Uh, yeah. So that, you know, I said, well, what about the college and everything you guys have covered? And they're like, don't worry about it. You know, you're good. They gave me an honorable discharge and that, was that, um, so, you know, they had all my information from those days. Um, yeah. the only other thing I can think is, is, you know, uh, the parties that, that Donnie was throwing, who was, who was one of my business partner there in New Orleans, those raves, you know, got national and even international attention. And, uh, eventually. Yeah. One night we were raided by the FBI and the DEA, um, which was crazy. I, I, the raid was taking place and I had actually left because I, I had a busted computer and I, I had all the computers there that controlled like the lasers and the video screens and all that stuff. Um, I had left to, to get another video card for this computer that was broken. And when I returned to the, the venue, which is this big opera house in downtown New Orleans, 
there's these guys with like, you know, the, the black coats and everything like that and the radios and the ears. And I'm like, man, Donnie really upgraded on security this year. And so I went to go get in and they're like, sir, this building's on our lockdown. And I said, hey, look, man, I, I'm trying to tell you I'm part of this production. They're like, sir, you cannot go in the building. Please step away. Man, are you an idiot? Do you know who I am? Yeah, I'm part of this production. Okay, like I, I've got to get in. It's, it's an hour before doors. I have to get this computer in there and this stuff running. So you need to let me in right now. I'm, I want to talk to your boss. I want to talk to your boss, really. This is ridiculous. I'm going to tell Donnie, but, and they're never going to hire you guys again. And he's like, oh, you're part of this production. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And so, we're like, oh, we're right this way. And so I went in through the backstage entrance with this computer on my shoulder. And as soon as I stepped through the door, the computer's taken off my shoulder. You know, FBI get on the wall, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, no. And they're cuffing me up. And they're walking me into this big opera house. And there's everybody that, like, the DJs and the, the crew that's doing the show. Everybody's in the audience handcuffed. And Gee. I'm like. Hmm. So that night, of course, they took, you know, everybody's picture. They made notes about them. They seized all my computers. Um, they downloaded them. They had a, like a, a, a young guy there with an external drive. And he was just like dumping all the contents of the hard drives of those machines. Um, and, and what it was, they were trying to use the, this old arcane law, the crack house law of, of having a venue for the sole purpose of using drugs. And they were trying to apply that to a... Uh, to a uh, music venue, and which is ridiculous, and so it went to court, and of course, you know, like the case, uh, you know, got beat. You know, Donnie beat it, and we're back on again doing party. So, those two things are the are the only interactions I've ever had with the government, and so I was thinking. So that, prior, you know, so prior to the FBI seizing your computer, at that time, no one really prior to that, no one really knew of your. IT skills at that point. Like no one was aware in the world what you were doing, what you're capable of. No one really knew until that FBI situation and the computer getting seized. And obviously they took the hard drive, huh? Uh, actually, no, they, they downloaded everything there that night. I had like eight machines yeah. and they started wow. at like 8 p.m. and they were done around midnight. And we actually got to still do the party that night. We just had everybody's waiting outside oh, till wow. midnight. They're like, here you go. Here's your machines back. And of course, I'm I'm protesting the whole time, like this is illegal, and da 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 da, and da da da, yeah. and um, and they had one of my laptops, and he, the guy, drops it on the ground. He goes, "Oops!" and it goes on the floor and shatters. The screen's broken. Keyboard pops apart, and he's like, "Oh man!" He picks it up. He's like, "You want to end up like your laptop? Why don't you go sit down? To go take a seat." So, and of course I'm still handcuffed. So I'm like, man, so, uh, yeah, I trashed my laptop. Didn't get that replaced, but they ended up giving me my gear back. So, but yeah, up until that point, you know, I, I mean, they might've known, you know, with house of blues, we did live, uh, pay-per-view events, yeah. um, which is really how I, I got my start there, uh, doing a live pay-per-view show for fat boy slim, which was, that was like launched my career. Um, so we, we did that in conjunction with MTV. Um, you know, all the House of Blues had radios, so I don't know if, you know, which I managed, and of course, all the networks, right? Uh, and email and their web servers. I, I, think, I think personally that this is not a conspiracy theory because the first one, yes, you were at West Point, you entered your military information. The I was not in one, West Point. Oh, you were not. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, no, I know. You were like, for, you uh, haven't, you just were Air trying Force, to. Air Force, Air Force, Air Force. So I, I feel like, um, I feel like this was exactly to where um, you entered the system. And it makes sense why you received a call in 2003 about going to Iraq. Uh, I mean, it got to be something they saw in you. They got to be something that you well, were so doing. I was supposed to graduate in 2000 and get my commission as an officer, right? Second lieutenant. Yeah. And um, we wanted to go on to flight school and all that good stuff. So they turned me down for military service, said that I, my, I physically, you know, with the hyperthyroidism, uh, yeah. wasn't, weren't going to cut it, unfortunately. And, uh, but then in 2003, three years later, you know, I'm, I'm getting a call, or not three years, actually five years, because that happened in 98. Yeah. So five years later, I'm getting a call to go work for the government in an active war zone. 
So uh, I guess I wasn't good enough for that, but I was good enough for Iraq. Because so, they didn't uh, care much about your life or what you were trying to do. I, I have no idea. I, I was just shocked to get the call. It was a lot for me to think about. You know, I'm kind of numb because it's, I just get this random call at first thing in the Monday yeah. morning. And yeah. so the guy says, uh, well, look, I'm going to give you some time to think about it. I'm going to call you back tomorrow morning uh, at uh, seven your time and for a decision. And I said, well, I just have 24 hours to think about it. He said, yeah. And I said, well, so this is kind of like an interview right now then. Because this is pretty accelerated. He said, yep. That's exactly what this is. And I said, well, you know, I, I know it's bad to start talking about compensation right up front, but, uh, you know, let's let's talk money here. Like, what, what's going on with that? And he says, uh, oh, well, we're, we're prepared to offer you 60. And what does that mean to you? Like, what do you think that means, Hamoudi? I mean, 60, I'm, I'm assuming 60,000? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and, but he didn't say 60,000. He just said 60. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, what? Uh, I was making like almost 59,000 at the time. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what? For not even $1,000 more, I'm going to go over there and risk like getting the old chopper. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm already thinking in my mind, you know what? I, I'm going to turn this down. Um, and so, you know, I told him, yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I went to a friend's house, uh, downtown New Orleans, and was talking to them about it. They're like, yo no don't do it don't do it you got a good thing here we're having fun you're in the prime of your life don't do that over there you know it's dangerous man they're, like they're cutting people's heads off and they're shooting people and just then just outside was because you know new yeah. orleans isn't a very, a very safe place as it is so um i said yeah man they're shooting people here too you know and so uh they said look look just don't do it just tell them no politely no and so the next morning um, he calls back seven o'clock and this time I'm answering the phone, all professional and everything. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is triple a. And so I answer the phone and he said, okay, so yeah, you've had time to think about it. So, um, what do you say? And just in that split second in my mind, uh, there was a voice that said, do it. And I, I, I couldn't even believe that I was saying this, but I, I just said, yeah, except and then inside I'm, I'm shocking myself for I'm like, oh my god, what did you just say? And um, so he said, well, that's that's great, but uh, it doesn't sound like you're very excited about this opportunity. And may I ask why? And I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm already making close to sixty right now, and so it's not going to be really a, a pay bump for me and the security situation and everything. Well, yeah, okay. Well, can I ask you a few personal questions? And I said, yeah, sure. Go ahead. He goes, okay, so you are a uh, single white male, 26 years old, living in New Orleans, Louisiana, correct? That's correct. Not, no information that I'd given to him before. I mean, they had it all. Um, he goes, and uh, it doesn't look like you've ever been married, so no divorce? Like, no. Uh, he goes, okay, do you have any uh, dependents? And I didn't know what that meant. So I was like, uh, what, what do you mean? Like, you know, do you, you have somebody that, you know, you care for that relies on your income? Uh, like, do you have any children? Uh, and I was like, not that I know of, you know? And so he was like, uh, okay. Um, right. So, so no dependents, no, you know, old grandma you're taking care of or anything like that. No ex-wife, no alimony payment. He goes, got it, got it, got it. Just confirming this information. So, Mr. Robbie, let me tell you something. I think that $60 an hour times 72 hours a week plus 50% uplift in hazard pay is damn good money for somebody that's 26 years old, single white male from New Orleans. And of course, my, my hand's like shaking. I'm trying to do that fuzzy math, right? And I couldn't think of anything. The only thing I could come out with, and I was stuttering, I was still nervous, I, I said, and 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 that 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 that's exactly why I'm all about bringing freedom and democracy to the Iraqi people. <laughs> and he, he, he's like, well, that's great. That's how great. much was the total we're gonna make every like a year? So yeah, I, I'd have to put it because you know with with taxes and everything like that, it ended yeah. up being basically it was like seven thousand a week before taxes. Yeah. Um. So you know, which isn't bad. Right, yeah, a thousand like, dollars a day. I um, was gonna make what I make in a year in two months. Right, two months. I mean, it, it was crazy. So, 
um, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I know enough that I'm like, wow, that's 200 and something thousand dollars. Uh, and so I'm like, he's like, great. So things are going to start moving really fast. I'm going to overnight you an onboarding packet. I need you to turn that around to me. First thing tomorrow morning it has to go back in the mail. And that onboarding packet is going to be a, uh, a drug test for hair and uh, a hair follicle drug test. And so, um, but don't take that right away. Don't even touch it. Don't break the seal on it. Uh, I'm going to get with you in about a week and schedule a, an appointment for you to go to a lab. And they're going to take your hair and you know, cut off a you know, like size of a pencil worth um, and then put it in the bag and they're going to test it. And based on those results, you know, we'll be able to go from there. And my heart sank because, I mean, yeah, I wasn't a big druggie, but, um, you know, I smoked a little weed back in the day. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, but it had been a while just, just by chance I had been kind of, you know, laying off the weed a little bit and yeah. exercising more. And so it had been, I don't know, been about a month since I last smoked anything. And so, um, but I'm still, you know, the hair is like a ticker tape, right? It, it's, it's, yeah. a, you can take it and you can see all the different chemicals and da, 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 da. And so, you know, I, I'll leave it at that being in, in, in entertainment, right? There's, there's other extra pre- curricular things going on. So I was concerned about that. And I, I just knew that I was, I was done for, like, there's no way I'm getting this job. And so I thanked yeah. him and I hung up the phone and my girlfriend at the time was like, Oh my God, baby, we're rich. We're rich. And I was like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> we like, yeah. she goes, well, you know what I mean? You know, like, this is great. Oh my God. I was like, no, it's not like, I've got all this long hair. I, there's yeah. no way I can pass this test. They're going to just reject me. She's like, no, 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 shut up, shut up, shut up. Get in the car, get in the car right now, right now. I'm like, man, it's only like 7.30 in the morning. Get in the car, don't ask questions. So I'm going down there. She's calling her friend that has a hair salon. And she, hey, 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 yes, I need you to open up early. I'll give you a couple hundred bucks. Just please, can, you, can we meet you at the hair salon? So yeah, yeah, we'll be there soon. So we get there. She's like, you know, what can I do for you? She says, look, we, all need, we need all that gone. All of his hair gone. And I'm like, what? What? like just don't ask questions just come on and so so we'll can we at least donate it and so like, yeah yeah we'll donate it so they put it in a ponytail cut it she took out the clippers shaved me down and then went with the straight razor and shaved me completely bald and wow. so i'm looking in the mirror i'm like i'm bald now she goes, okay yeah we're good all right here's your money all right come on get back in the car let's go and we went to kmart that's back when there was still kmart and uh, we go over into the uh, I guess the hygiene section and there is this stuff called Nair, which I didn't know what that was uh, until that day. I, I learned what it was that day, but it's, it's like a hair remover. And she was just clearing like the whole shelf and throwing it into the, the shopping cart. She was like, all right, let's go, 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 go. So we check out, you know, a basket full of bottles of Nair. We get back to the house. She's reading the label on it. She's like, all right, it says no more than like 15 minutes or whatever. Like you're going to get 30. So she's like, take your clothes off, strip, get naked, um, come on in the bath bathroom, get in the bathtub, stand like this, you know, and spread eagle. And she starts breaking the tops off. She wasn't going to just squirt it out. She'd break the top off and was gooping Jeez. it out and slapping it all over me. I'm like, look, dude, no, not my eyebrows or my eyelashes, man. <laughs> she's like, no, they, they can't get anything from those. Right. And so Damn. I'm like, okay. So she covers me. I mean, every crack and cranny. Okay, my entire body is covered in this nair, which smells terrible. My hair is all melting and shriveling up, and it's starting to burn. And in 30 minutes, I'm in there like, ah, oh. she's like, shut up, you know, stop being such a wuss. So uh, finally, she comes in there and she sprays me down, and I'm hairless, like I don't have except for my eyebrows and eyelashes. And so she's like, wow. perfect. I said, yeah. I mean, this is gonna be a little bit weird when I go to a hair test and I have no hair. No hair. And and so and so uh can you still hear me there? Sorry. I, yeah, I can hear you. Headphones yeah. was messing up a little bit. Um so get you know, dry it off and everything, and, and she says, Look, here's what you're gonna tell them. This is your story. You're a swimmer. Okay. You're a swimmer. And okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was in pretty good shape, and I was like, yeah, I guess I could pass for that. I was, you know, slim and cut. I didn't yeah. have a six-pack. I probably had, like, a four-pack or something, but and I was toned up, 
no fat. And so I said, okay, that's, that's the story. So, um, I got all the other paperwork filled out, everything ready to go. And the time comes for me to go take my hair test. And so I'm leaving to go take the hair test and I'm just closed the front door. I'm getting in the car and I can hear the phone ringing inside. So, and it's an old landline. So I, you know, I have to run back inside and I pick up the phone and it's that recruiter. And he said, you know, hey, I uh, just wanted to check in with you. Have you left yet for your test? And I said, actually, you caught me just walking out of the door. I'm going right now. I'm going to get the test done and everything. He's like, okay, good, 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 good. I'm glad I caught you. I'm glad I caught you. Look, that you, do you have the test kit with you? And I said, yeah. He goes, okay, just throw that in the trash. Okay, we sent you the wrong test. We don't even need a hair test. We just need you to go pee in a cup. No, you're fucking kidding. And I'm like, oh. that's great. Damn. <laughs> that's awesome oh my and so God. and my, of course my girlfriend at the time she's dying she's like ah <laughs> oh, and so i'm like oh that's yeah she, he said still go to your your appointment right but just go do a whiz quiz pee in the cup you'll be good oh, yeah. so i went pee in the cup of course nothing there you know i'm i'm clear and so that's it next thing i know is a few days later i'm flying from new orleans to el paso to fort bliss and uh you go there, they give you all your battle rattle. Um, you know, they arrange transport. You go with a bunch of other guys uh, that are deploying. So fast, fast forward, fast forward, yeah. you get to Iraq. Hmm. And, you know, being like, you know, from, you know, being a guy from the United States, never been to combat zone, never seen all this craziness. What was your reaction right. when you first got there? So, uh, you know, we landed in Kuwait. It was a tent city at the time, Camp Wolf. So I, I, I was like in this tent and uh, in a rack, you know, for, um, uh, or a cot rather, uh, for a couple of days, which was miserable, um, super hot, humid. And uh, finally get word that uh, there's a transport ready for me to, to go to Baghdad. And so I was going to go to Camp Victory. And so uh, I walk out on the flight line and it's a C-130. And I'm like, well, this is cool. I've never flown on a C-130 before. And it's it's late in the evening, so it's not quite dark yet, but uh, it's getting there. So uh, we load, everybody gets loaded in. I'm sitting, you know, in, in the, the cargo straps, and we take off. So, um, you know, we're airborne, and, and as we start approaching Baghdad, by this time, it's, it's dark. Um, and this is, I guess, September of 2003. So um, we, the, the guys say, okay, we're going, we're going dark. and the next thing I know, like all the lights, the little lights, flashing lights on the wings and stuff like that, the directional lights, they all went off. All the lights inside the plane went off and the crew put down nods so they had, you know, their, their night vision on. And so you could see these little dots and it was black out, just completely black out. And I'm Jeez. like, what's happening? And, you know, at the time they did what's called like a corkscrew. So they get over the airfield at, at Biop, right, the airport. And they screw down real tight uh, that way because they, they had control, mostly control of the airport and Camp Victory. But the areas around that, I mean, look, Fallujah is not very far away, right? It's right there. Uh, next door. Yeah. And I mean, so as we're, we're doing this corkscrew, you know, a C-130 doesn't have many windows. It just has a window every now and then. But I can see out and I see tracers like going up in the sky. And I actually see a, a uh, I don't know if it's a rocket or a mortar. Woof light up just there at the airport so i'm like what every what? time a c-130 landed in the airport they would shoot their motors the time the c-130s are, are like literally landing yeah so it, landing and taking off was the most dangerous part of that thing that's what was happening this night and so i'm like oh my god i was regretting the whole like yeah i'll do it decision and so the plane lands, you know, the, the cargo bay opens and they're like, move, 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 move. And this, this old bus pulls up with no lights on. They're getting everybody on the bus fast, fast, fast. Go, 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 go. And there were several uh, contractors that were actually on that C-130 flight and they stepped off onto the, the tarmac there. And they're like, no, 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 I, I, I want to go home. I want to go home. They're like, no, you got to. Move, no, 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 I, 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 I'm too afraid. I, I, no, I can't, no, I'm not doing this. There's, a, there's an alarm going off. There's, you know, fire. And they just, they freaked out. And so, which, you know, is understandable. So I, I, I run to uh, the PAX terminal and there were some guys waiting for me there to pick me up. 
and I get in the Tahoe and there's no windshield and the passenger side door is full of holes and there's old blood all on the floorboard. And uh, I asked them, I was like, what happened here? And they're like, yeah, IED. Um, and I, I later learned it was a guy by the name of Buckmaster um, who had gotten killed just a few days before. And I was sitting in the seat where, where he had lost his life. So I'm like, Jeez. wow. So we're hauling ass uh, to Camp Victory. Uh, no windshield. I mean, for, those who, for those who are listening, you land in 2003. That is the beginning of the violence. Yeah. Entering in 2004, that's when the shit went down. Like, this is when the fighting got even uglier, you, which you were there at that point. But for those who are listening, uh, have no idea how many contractors were actually brought to Iraq. And as soon as they got off the bird, as soon as they got off the plane, they looked at left to right and said, this is not what I signed up for. Well, right. it's too late. We're already here. And I met interpreters, like people who were uh, Arabic speakers from the United States that were told, oh, you're going to make $150,000 a year. You're going to be rich. You're going to come back all set up. And as soon as they got out of the plane, bro, they come in and they see like my uniform, Iraqi uniform, all full of blood and everything. They were like, what is this? What's going on here? And then we're like, that's not what I signed up for. I want to go back. And then they're like, well, in order to get your bag, it's going to take us like three weeks. So you should get used to this situation. I mean, right. damn, man. damn. It was a, it was a, it was a shock for sure. I mean, we're, we're driving, you know, pretty fast to Camp Victory, which is next to the airport. And of course there's no windshield. So all the bugs are coming in and hitting me and stuff. Ah. So we, uh, we get to Camp Victory, you know, everybody gets their quarters and that's whenever I, I meet my boss there. Um, and so he's kind of briefing me on, on the mission, uh, the areas that I'm going to manage, uh, again, from Baghdad to the Kuwaiti border, essentially, and um, kind of get squared away. And uh, it's a couple weeks passed, a few weeks passed. I'm not really sure now. It's been a while. But uh, you remember the day that Saddam got caught, right? Everybody does. Right? Yep, I remember that day like, pretty yeah, well. We got him, right? Well, that night. Um, across from Camp Victory, across from the highway there, there used to be a whole base for the Republican Guard and Fedayeen Saddam. And of course, yeah. we had bombed it and stuff. It was pretty bombed out, but it was still a hotbed of, of insurgency. And, and these ex, ex Bathy, you know, Saddam military guys were attacking Camp Victory on a regular. So uh, this one night, they attacked the one of the gates at Camp Victory, which is not far from where our, our trailers were set up. And, and bullets are flying everywhere, going through the building. Um, so we, you know, we had those scud bunkers, the, the, you know, cement little holes you, you know, kind of cram into and everybody had their rally stations, you know, like 20 people here, 20 people there. So we get to my scud bunker and I'm like, man, this is nuts. Um, and my boss is missing. And Jeez. so you know, they keep calling his name and they're on the radio to the other rally points and he's the only one not accounted for. And this is a problem, right? Um, so I, I said, look, I'm going to go run to his trailer and see if he's there. They're like, no, stay in the bunker. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going, I'm going. I, we got to find him. So I just took off. They told me not to, whatever. I took off. So I ran, 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 ran and uh, get to his trailer. And I, I, I just opened it up. I was in a hurry. I didn't even knock. And I opened it up. And this like bell billows of smoke came out, uh, weed smoke, right? <laughs> he's in there, oh he's in there doing this, and he's like, Oh, and I was like, Whoa, what the fuck, dude? They're, they're like, They're you know, we're under attack, man. Like, everybody's looking for you. He's like, Get, get in there, close the door, close the door, close the door. Just then, whack through the ceiling into the floor, which I still have that, that bullet, that's my bullet. Um, a fresh hot 7.62 by 39 round. I pick it up out of the floor. I'm like, we have to go, man. Look, they just put a hole in your trailer. Uh, he's like, look, hey, look, no, no, no. Before we go, you cannot tell anybody about this. Please, man, please. All right, please. This, I need this job. It, it, it's, it's a great thing for my career. Like, please, you cannot tell anybody. And I said, look, man, I'll keep my mouth shut on one condition. And he's like, what? what? Name it. Anything. Money? Like, what do you want? I said, let me hit that pipe real quick. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, that's what? in the middle of an attack. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, man, that's really good. It's been a while. 
He's yeah. like, wait a minute, man. Wait a minute. You're not really a swimmer, are you? You think it's not you are not a swimmer. No. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I'm trying to pass the test. So, yeah, <laughs> That's man. That's why you so that, was, that was That was that. And, uh, you know, yeah. of course, we got back to the scud bunker, and that was our little secret. Um, but, you know, great guy. I won't, of course, won't name him. But uh, so really past like past past this craziness, like you when you arrived, and you started literally driving around the whole entire country, which 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 you actually started driving through the most hectic, most violent areas, Najaf all over the the south. Um, at the time, the Meta Militia, the rise of the Meta Militia, yep. Muqtada Sadr went to yep. fight us. What was your main job? I know you were doing some crazy stuff out there. Uh, you were trying to find all these bombs and weapons, and Iraq prior had all these chemicals, all this kind of uh, weaponry systems that were established. What was your exact job that you you started doing while doing that? So my mission, I had a, a you know a team. Obviously, I can't do all this on my own, and uh, uh, my mission was to uh, get to these various sites, set up you know satcom, um, a network. Uh, Voice over IP servers, file servers, uh, radio towers, or or you know big ass antennas uh, for radio coverage. Because I mean these sites were huge. I mean they're massive, especially the one in Najaf. And uh, so Najaf was the first one I went to. And you know when we got there, it you know it was an old Iraqi weapons depot. And I mean it it's these huge bunkers, earthen covered bunkers on a five star pattern. So there's like one, two, three, four, five. And uh, you open the doors of these things, and there were just every kind of weapon you could imagine to the ceiling. And he had actually run out of, of room, and there was like this five-kilometer ring road there, and there were just weapons stacked up, you know, 15, 20 feet high along this five-kilometer road. It just give you an idea of, of the amount of munitions there. Massive, like, Scud missiles. They had frogs, which are a little bit smaller than a Scud missile. The Iraqi Al Samud missiles, just weaponry everywhere, and the base had been um, had been abandoned. I guess you know when when we did our first push coming from Kuwait, the soldiers guarding this base. I mean, it's the desert, right? You can see forever. Yeah. And uh, they they saw this armada, you know, of U.S. forces, coalition forces coming to them, and they, I mean, took off their uniforms, sat down their guns, and they just fled. So. Uh, U.S. military gets there, and this kind of this story kind of repeats itself over and over again, all the way up through the north. Yeah. Um, and you know, we look around. Okay, you know, all clear, uh, great. And they kind of you know do a little write up on the site, and then they just keep on pressing towards Baghdad. The problem with that is that after they leave, there's a vacuum, right? And so the local populace was coming into these sites that have, you know, warehouses full of plastic explosives. Uh, grenades, mortars, Jesus. artillery rounds, heavy weapons, anti-aircraft weapons. I mean, you name it, it's there. And they just started looting these places wholesale, right? Holy crap! So and made a made a mess. Like a, like a, it's I'll, I'll get to that point. Um, so we we Which arrived later at the, on became the cache for the cache for the meta militia. Well, that and and all the other insurgent groups, you know. We wondered yeah. where, I mean, where are these guys getting stuff for IEDs? And it just was, was a horrible oversight on, on, on the part of the, the, the military and the initial team that went in there to leave these places uh, so unsecured. Um, so you wonder where they get all these weapons and all these explosives and stuff to make these horrific IEDs and, and, and continue this you know, long-lasting insurgency. And that was the primary thing that fueled them. Uh, so it this was really have, unfortunate. If these if these locations were have controlled military locations that full of weapons and explosive and everything, right? Truly, the insurgency would have taken a different direction in Iraq. It would have. It would have. I mean, it was the first of a series of missteps. You know, you have Bremer, which don't get me started on him. I think he should be tried yeah. for for war crimes personally. But um, you know, that's getting political. But um, you know, yeah. We, we left these sites unguarded and then he disbands the Iraqi army and it like, what yeah. do you put, you put hundreds of thousands of soldiers out of work now and they got to feed their families. You know, the economy is ruined. 
Right. Yeah. And, and the country's awash in heavy, heavy weaponry now. You know, what are you going to do? I mean, pick up your gun and fight the American, you know, blow some Americans up. You know, this blonde haired, blue eyed kid from North Dakota, he doesn't have any relation to you. You know, you're trying to feed your family. Yeah. So, and you know, you, you know it, it's, it's a disaster how this went, man. Like how uh, the black market of weaponry just, to, just went out of control. Um, at the time, I have never seen a 12-year-old child who was selling grenades on the, on the highway. It was crazy. I, I saw this no, firsthand no. In, in Hilla, yeah. you know, which is just a little bit yeah. north of Najaf. They had an open-air arms market. And, I mean, it, it was crazy. Just put, you know, whatever you want. You want RPGs? You want this, that, and the other? So our, our job was to, you know, now we've, these sites have been looted. So there's almost yeah. mines and all sorts of stuff all over the place. It's a disaster. Uh, there's no infrastructure. There's no electricity. There's no plumbing. There's no running water. Uh, there's none of that, right? Uh, no, no fuel. Just zero. Nothing. Just this looted, right. abandoned base. And so we set to uh, building everything. I mean, shower trailers. Uh, you know, regular trailers for accommodations. Uh, cafeteria. Uh, you know, I was working how on many, the communication. How many of you guys were in there the whole time? At that particular site so that that site was it was crazy it was i would say maybe 80 um Whoa. 80 people at that site it eventually became fob duke yeah um but it, in the initial part of it it was just us on this little patch which we we had a we had a caterpillar tractor that we would push the sand up and make berms around yeah. like our our core base and then of course we had all the concertina wire and stuff like that around that and then uh ops and different fighting positions and so on uh, in case we were ever attacked uh do you think but then, do you think do you think because they didn't really know they went straight to saddam palaces and started making these little fop inside of the palaces and they were amazed by the infrastructure saddam built and never paid attention to the weapon warehouses that were all around the country well it's low-hanging fruit right yeah. So n nobody wants to do the job, the dirty job that we did and, and securing that place. And, you know, we lived in tents for, gosh, a couple months at least while we built the base. You know, we, we had to take a dump and these what we called honey pots, you know what I mean? These, these metal drums that you kind of sat over and, and then you had to burn the, the poop every night, you know, which wasn't pleasant. Uh, MREs, that was what was on the menu. And that was, that's all you had, the MREs. and, and and uh and water so uh but we did we we in short order a couple months we built an entire uh base for us again about 80 people and uh but we're responsible for our own protection um our vehicles as they promised were going to be armored no they were just straight up off the line ford f-350 four by fours that's it white <laughs> wow. so the first thing we did was start making mud and painting the trucks with mud um, but no, no armor in them, no nothing. Uh, we welded seats, swivel seats in the beds to where we could have a saw gunner. Uh, we rolled in convoys of, of five. So, um, yeah, that was kind of interesting. I'm like, wow, this isn't exactly what it was built to be, you know? Yeah. Um, but we did, we, we managed to eventually have, you know, an MWR hall and, and various creature comforts. And I think at that point, you know, we started inventorying all the weapons, right? Um, all the bomb techs had these things. I don't know if you remember the Palm Pilots. It was like the yep. precursor to the smartphone. And they had all these Palm Pilots and they would go and open up a bunker and they would inventory, okay, we have 20,000 RPGs of this model and they'd put it in their Palm Pilot. And then every night when they would come in from the field, they, I had all these cradles set up in the office and they would put all the cradles in I would take the dump of the data and I would shoot it off to DC and also to uh, the Army Corps of Engineers. And so, because we were working with the Army Corps of Engineers and then in coordination with the Iraq Survey Group, which was, you know, the guys, they were the guys who were tasked with finding the weapons of mass destruction, which was managed by the CIA. It was, it was a CIA deal. Um, so that's, that was the key thing. We had inventory everything. And so finally we got most of the site inventoried and now it's time to blow stuff up. So. Uh, every day we had a ritual, you know, they would go out at, at, you know, three, three thirty, and they would set all the charges on these shots. We, we, we called them shots. They, they would build up a hundred tons of munitions 
and uh, there's a science to it too because you don't want to explode this stuff and make it go everywhere you want it to make a crater right or else you're just making more yeah. of a mess and so they would you know set the the plastic explosive strategically and build the shot strategically and then uh we'd go back to the safe area which is a couple miles away about a couple miles away and um you know hit the button and crack a beer you know uh so and every day at three thirty, four o'clock boom you know mushroom cloud on the horizon so that was kind of cool. well the videos of it it's wild yeah man. <laughs> yeah it's like I know, six I days, you guys a, six days rocket away. like that video of you guys I think it was you and one other guy, you guys, what kind of missile did you guys held? And you just shot it at the, into the weapon warehouse. Okay. All right. So this, this, let me explain that. And this is where yeah. I kind of started getting into scrounging. Uh, yeah. You know, Cause U S military saw that this place was safe. We never had one attack. Uh, yeah. So in 2004, they came and they're like, we're going to put a big fob here. Bob. And it was massive. I mean, yeah. pretty decent sized fob right they had a uh an airstrip for for like the helicopters the marines came in army came in uh you know just the whole thing of like chinooks and cobras and apaches were there a big like defac we even had a uh a px man it was in a it was in a trailer but it was a px Damn. which is crazy going from our little isolated place in the middle of nowhere i mean in the middle of nowhere uh to that um so big now army came in or being a big fob and bigger yeah, exactly so i'm like man we we you're, had the safest place in, the, in iraq yeah. you're in the biggest den of the Mehdi militia in the country right well so so here's a, a, a little side note on that so you know i'm sure you know who ali sistani is right yeah um so he's like he's like the power broker and najaf and he's the supreme and, leader of all Shiite 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 Shiite. yeah and shiite islam yeah. exactly so we were employing a lot of Najafis, you know, locals from Najaf, uh, to as ammo handlers to help us unload these bunkers and inventory stuff and, and put the bombs on the truck and so on. And, uh, you know, we treated them well. We treated them with respect. Uh, there was no, you know, crazy Abu Ghraib type stuff going on. Uh, yeah. They were great. It was a great relationship. We employed a lot. I mean, hundreds of Najafis at a time when, uh, you know, it was tough to find work. You know, you're either an insurgent or you were just out of work. And yeah. so um, we treated them well. And so Sistani said, you know, he, he put out the word that if anybody, it's not a military base, they're destroying weapons. And, and actually, we were actually educating Bedus because uh, yeah. there were mines and all sorts of stuff everywhere. Yeah, and they were, they were getting all over the ground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were getting blown up. You know, their, their, their camels, their sheep were getting destroyed, their kids, you know, Ooh, what's that reaching out and boom. And so, you know, we educated them when we were at Encounter them. We had these little flags that we gave them that whenever they would find stuff, they would put the flag. And then we would we made these runs throughout the surrounding areas uh, that were known for their, like, you know, migratory patterns. So Sistani said, look, that's not a military. They're, they're actually doing good work out there. We've got no problem. They're treating our people with respect. They're, they're, they're paying our people a fair wage. Um, so if anybody touches a hair on the heads of the, the 80 people out there um your whole family is going to die and we're going to destroy your house oh, i think that's wow. that's what's going to happen so you know and, and that goes for you muktada you know so we're not going to have any of this medi militia stuff and blah 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 blah. y'all do what y'all got to do with the army and stuff but leave these guys alone and then so we're like, man, this is this is great. Yeah. If you got Sistani words like that, right? That's full protection. No one's gonna right. touch you. Right. And we 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 joked. We're like, man, it's club fed. You know, we're we're in the safest place in Iraq. And then yeah. boom, this fob, you know, that has a capacity for like five thousand, I think, you know, soldiers. So we're like, oh man, that kind of changes things now. You know, it makes it more of a target. But yeah. I I ended up getting you know, building relationships with people and, and wheeling and dealing, especially with the supply sergeants. And um, I, it was around the time of whenever things were upticking, you know, with it was in 2004, mid 2004 with the Medi militia. And there, a stand down order came that they didn't want any uh, convoys unless it was an emergency rolling out from Bob Duke. Uh, that yeah. meant our convoys too. And same for the military, you're just confined to the FOB. And that really 
put a put us in a bad position booze wise, right? Because we would when we would go to we'd go to Baghdad once a week to the airport yeah. because the, the duty free was still open. The rest of the airport was abandoned, but the duty free was yeah. still open. And we'd load like two truckloads full of every kind of liquor and beer you could imagine. And so we always had had booze. And so now we can't make that run anymore and we're stuck there and you know we're out it it had been, I don't know, man, a month since anybody had, had anything. And so uh, one day the, the mail comes through and uh, uh, they, they, they allowed us to do a run to Babel to, to Hilla to get the mail from, from the Polish fob up there. So we got mm-hmm. the mail and came back and they're passing out the mail and, you know, it's APO, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the guys gets a package and it's kind of heavy and he opens it up. And I don't know, they're supposed to scan this stuff or whatever I heard or they search it. I, I don't know. I don't know how it made it through, but it was a three liter yeah. bottle of Dr. Pepper, except it was full of vodka. Damn. And so <laughs> we're like, yeah, I'm like, Woo. All right, hey, we're going to do a bonfire and hey, yeah. go get the speakers. And, you know, we're going to like whoop, whoop tonight. And fun. so, yeah. And so everybody's like, yeah. And, hey, we can't tell the army, right? They're going to want some. And like, this is, I mean, three liters isn't enough really for us, you know? So. And I said, wait, 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 guys, 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 let's, let's be strategic about this. Let's think. This is liquid. All right. Mon- money does nothing for you if you can't buy anything with it, right? But we've got, yeah. ego. do you know how valuable this is? It's like, yeah. give it to me and trust it to me. Let me go talk to Big Army and maybe I can get us something. They said, man, Aubrey, it's got to be something, you know, really, really good uh, to exchange for this, you know, like, it, but we'll, we'll trust you. We'll trust you. I'll be right back. I, I can get a hold of anything. I can wheel and deal. Let me go. Damn. I knew exactly what I wanted. So I went over to the supply sergeant's tent, and they're all in there, you know, just kind of hanging out. It's it's nighttime, and uh, they're like, hey, what's going on, man? You know, come in, because I was a frequent visitor. And and uh, I said, gentlemen, I pulled out of my bag, like, behold, three liters of the finest vodka known to man right here in the, right in the right 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 right. and they're like oh yeah yeah so people are getting cups and in the, the hand of the most and, wildest person in iraq right. <laughs> right. and so uh so i said no 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 wait 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 okay it comes with a price like dude whatever man like what, what you need do you need more uniforms you need boots uh you need yeah. do we, we got some nods in man like they're not on the books yet you need night vision uh, you know, da, da, da. I mean, we could, uh, we could give you like a few grenades and, you know, make, make a little package for you. I was like, nah, man, I've got all that. I, I, don't want that. I said, but what I do want, I want rockets. And they're like, what do you mean rockets? Like AT4s. Like, I know you guys have a couple of connexes over there. You guys have been doing fam fire training, you know, familiar, like familiarizing and so on. Nobody's keeping track of that stuff. Y'all aren't like keeping track of the cereals like you should. There's a whole pile of used ones out there that are just going in the trash. Like they're not even being disposed of properly. Like, you know, I, I want, I want some AT4s. And they're like, first of all, you get no AT4s. It's absolutely not happening. Uh, you're not going to get one. You're not going to get, you're going to get none. And I was like, well, you know, I had a feeling you'd say that, but I had to ask. Right. So, yeah. uh, well, anyways, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and leave. And we're having a big party over there at our base tonight. And there's going to be music and a bonfire and everything. And uh, none of you guys are invited. Okay. So just, just <laughs> listen, listen and weep. And I'm gone. And so I, I turned to leave and they're like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Don't leave angry, man. Come on. We get, there's got to be a way we can, we can make something happen here. I was like, I already told you. I said, I know my, my demands are this. I have three liters of vodka. I want an AT4 for each liter. And they're like, no, nah, man, look, look, hang on, let, let's go talk. So they, they went off to the side and they're talking, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. They came back and, okay, all right, look, man, look, we'll give you, okay, we'll give you one for that. I was like, aha, see, if you can give me one, you can give me three. I said, I'm, I'm not accepting anything less than three. It's three liters of vodka, okay. three AT4s. And the and point I, of it, you wanted to blow up the weapon. And just, uh, the oh, no, weapon. no, no. I, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. It, it was, yeah. I thought it was a very pragmatic uh, point, you know, mission that I had there, yeah. ob- objective. Uh, so, like, you know, three AT4s or nothing. And so they went and talked to you and they came back and they're like, all right, man. All right. 
all right, you got the eight for us. Mike. Uh, they're like, what are you going to do with these anyways? I said, look, man, I'm not asking you what you're going to do with the vodka, right? We're just doing a trade here. So just I take the AT4s and you can take the vodka and do whatever you want with it. And they're like, well, just, you know what I mean? You know about those? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, totally lying. I, I never shot one before. <clears throat> and so I went back to our base and I go into the MWR where everybody was waiting. And they're like, what you got? I uh, pull out this big, big, big bag, long bag. And I was like, AT fours, and they're like, AT four rocket. They're Holy like, uh, man, yeah, we, we can't, we can't drink those. I was like, look, yeah. look, listen to me, listen to me. Live to drink another day, right? Right now we're rolling in five vehicle convoys, five trucks, right? Saw yeah. gunner and then truck, saw gunner, truck, yeah. saw gunner. Yeah, so five. Uh, I said so, right? Lead vehicle AT four, middle vehicle AT four. Tail vehicle AT4. We've got AT4s now, right? If somebody messes with us, we just right, just blow them up, right? Destroy it. And then and then you survive, and then you can go home or go on R and R, and you can get wasted, drink whatever you want. So yeah, we're not going to drink today, but we got AT4s, man. Like there's yeah. no other civilian convoys rolling around here with that kind of firepower. With that kind of like, firepower. yeah, I get uh, yeah, okay, I guess so. Like uh, not bad. So we got these AT4s, and, uh, and that's where the video comes in that, that I sent you. Uh, we, we had them for, gosh, like six months. Thankfully, we'd never had to use them because, I mean, you don't want to have to use those. It's pretty bad. If you have yeah. And uh, we're out in Amara and, uh, at this weapons depot that we're, you know, securing and, and doing some demo work. The Brits are there, and uh, one of the guys came over and was like, hey, Hey man, we saw those AT fours. Like, yeah, they're in the three trucks over there. Hey, I just had an idea. Why don't? And of course, again, brilliant ideas whenever you've been drinking, right? Um, we were a little, little tipsy. Why don't? There's that building, a bunker over there that's full of artillery propellant, and these things should be able to punch through the concrete. Let's shoot it. See what happens. I'm like, man, and we had got in trouble. For another incident in Coot, I think I sent you the video that the 500 ton, ton deal that that's a whole other yeah. story. But yeah, we were already kind of on thin ice, and so I'm like, all right, look, everybody, this time, this time we got to have our stories straight. Like it was like this when we got here, right? Looters, whatever. But we found it this way, and then that's it, right? That's what that's our story. Okay, yeah, that's the story. So, I'm like, all right, so uh, who wants to shoot it? We had this guy that was in our group, Chucky, the big Viking looking dude. And uh, like Chucky, all right, you shoot it. And well, why me? Well, you're, you're a big guy and whatever. Like, come on, man. Like, you shoot it. Uh, all right. Uh, what do I do? I was like, I don't know, man. I mean, this guy. Who here knows how to shoot an AT4? There was no nobody one. with us that knew. So we had these things <laughs> in our truck and didn't know how to use them. <laughs> how to use it because <laughs> everybody assumed that the other guy you know what i mean that the other guy how to do it but not really yeah and so um uh, they're like oh god well let's let's look and i think these had maybe were intended for like dual use maybe to be distributed to the iraqi military um and i say that because you know you've ever you've been on a plane right and yeah. in the seat pocket in front of you there's the evacuation instructions right yeah. And you don't have to speak English to know what to do. It's like those little cartoon characters, right? Yep. Slide down the slide and you open it and yeah. it shows you put the mask down, right? It's like that cartoonish yeah. kind of drawing. So it had all the way down. It. Yeah, all the way down the side of the AT4 was that. And it was like these little boxes of this. And the one that really cracked me up was it had a guy shouldering the AT4. And then there was a guy behind him and there's a big fireball coming out the back the back blast right and the guy's standing behind him and he has his hands on his head and his eyes are x's and his mouth is going like this like and there and his hair's on fire right and so there's a big circle and a line through it so like don't don't stand behind the guy don't shooting the at4 right? So, right right so i thought that was that was hilarious so yeah chucky ended up uh shooting it and uh it just incinerated that bunker. I mean, propellant goes to thousands of degrees in seconds, you know, just like in a flash. Damn. 
just completely destroyed the bunker uh, with that. And, and thankfully, I don't ever know what happened. I, I, uh, I moved on to another base. I don't know what happened to the other two. Um, but yeah, that was, that's when I started my wheeling and dealing. And I'm like, man, if I that's when you were guys rock, were going rockets, wild like, in Iraq. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you had to, we were our own security. You know, your life was in yeah. your hands and it was the wild west. And there were no laws. You know, the only law that people obeyed was gravity, right? So um, uh, you had to do what you had to do. So, um, and you know, you know, at that point, at what point did you arrive in the MOD? I, I, I remember, I would say when I met you, it was back in 2005, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was like, I want to say mid to late 2005. Um, I was I was in Najaf for a while, um, and if if I may, um, yeah, one of the kind of the side things uh, that was kind of unique, um, <clears throat> we had our our shower trailers right, and uh, the Iraqis that lived on base, like you know my friend Shauki and so on, they they didn't they didn't have them. They were just using ours in our bathroom and. So we all took turns, like, you know, doing janitorial duties. We didn't have, you know, people to clean up after us. So, you know, yeah, you had this day, you clean the bathrooms, the showers, whatever. And uh, I go into the stall and there's like the worst diarrhea all on the walls, on the toilet, everywhere. Dang. And I'm like, oh, and I got to clean that up, man. You know, and I'm like, man. I want to know who did this, right? I, I got to find the guy who did this. And so, um this kept happening. And now it's even being mentioned in the morning briefings. Like, whoever's doing this, you're going to get your ass when we find out who it is. Like, stop it. So this one day, I, I go in there. I'm, I'm a little bit early. I take a shower. And, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody's in there. And I get the water going and whatnot. And I hear some, like, <laughs> shuffling around. I'm like, hello? And then just, blah, blah, blah. blah. You can see, you know, from the bottom of the stall, there's just this nasty diarrhea. And I'm like, it's, it's, the, it's the guy. It's the guy. So I'm, I'm, I run down, run down. I've got a towel around me. And I'm like, hey, who is that? And I'm peeking through. And it's one of our Najafis. He's got his dish dash hiked up. Oh. He's got one foot on the toilet seat and one foot in the toilet, sandal in the oh. toilet full of shit, right? And he's like, oh, how to use it. Ha Harun? Harun, uh, please, please, uh, one minute, one minute. I'm like, yeah, okay, man. And you know how all the bathrooms over there, they have the little sprayer in the stall, right? Oh, so then man. there's a lot of spraying, and now it's all coming out and swirling around the drain in the middle of the room, and it's just disgusting. It's because they didn't and know so, how to use the bathroom, right? Right, and so he, he comes out, he goes, Harun, Harun, please tell me, uh, how do you do it? And I was like, what, what do you mean? He, he's like, how do you make the shit? You know, I, I, I stand, the glass is so thin. So he's talking about the porcelain rim. He's like, I stand on the glass and I slip. And then I stand on the plastic and it, the plastic moving this way, this way. So I, sh I shit and the shit going everywhere. I said, look, man, you don't do any of that. You don't stand on anything. You sit down. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, you put the seat down and you sit down on the seat to make the shit. Which and he's like, probably he's like, an cannibal from the Jap that never seen one before. Right. No. Yeah. And he's like, uh, oh, that is, man. that is really nasty. I will never put my ass where another man's ass has been. I'm like, that's nasty. This is nasty, man. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're nasty. <laughs> so that's what we learned. We like, we, we have to like make uh, a trailer for the Najafis. Right. So we did. <laughs> Yeah. We did. We built them their own shower trailer with the stalls, you know, the ones with the hole in the floor and everything. And it was really nice, actually. But yeah. over time, they let it become just disgusting. I mean, flies and poop in and out and flooded with just, just I mean, you saw the bathrooms in the MOD. It was like that. I did. I and did. so now it's like a health hazard that's stinking up the base. And so uh, the camp manager comes to me one day, a little guy by the name of Gaines. He's like, hey, AAA, come over here for a sec. Come over here for a sec. It was on a Sunday. And that's our day off. And uh, he's like, hey, so uh, look, man, these goddamn Iraqis, you know, they 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 just made a disaster of, of their shower trailer. And it, you said tracking yeah. the shit everywhere and the flies and the all oh, the stink is terrible. Why don't we do something nice for them today? Let's go power wash. I said, no, 
Uh uh-uh. uh. They they have to be responsible for their own stuff, man. They got it. We built that for them. They need to keep it clean. He's like, I know, I know, but you're not doing anything anyways. We're in the middle of the desert. Come on, man. Tell you what, you get the power sprayer, and I'll actually do the spray. Uh, yeah. Okay, man. All right. So I went and I got the power sprayer, got everything hooked up. He got his, you know, his his rubber boots on and his gloves, and he goes in there. And man, I guess he didn't think it through. He went to one of the the stalls with just mounds of poop, right? And he Damn. he shot the the power sprayer in the corner, yeah, and it went. All over his boosh, yeah, it just uh, instantly covered. And I hear uh, I hear like the gun uh, drop, like boom. I hear the gun drop, and I hear like. <laughs> And he's he's comes running out of, of the trailer, he's flailing, he's just covered <laughs> in and shit, right? And I'm like, ah! <laughs> he's like, spray me off, spray me off. He's trying not to talk because he's getting shit in his mouth. And I'm like, dude, that sprayer has got shit all over it. Hang on. So they like, yeah. ran back to the trailer, got something to wipe it off with, and I'm he's like stripping naked now. And I'm like, turn around, turn around. I'm spraying him off and just disgusting. Damn. So I was like, so um, how do you feel about him now? He was like, fuck them goddamn Iraq. I was like, that's good, at that man. Point, he was done. This was his limit. I mean, yeah. so, it, you know, you, co- you, you end this craziness of, of two years of Iraq, and you end up coming to the MOD in 2005, yep. which you were right. appointed at the time to become the head of, like, the IT or – run the internet uh, for the MOD or what exactly the job they got you into do when you came yeah, to the MOD? Uh, director of information technology and communications so that encompassed yeah. the, the IDN is what it was called, the Iraqi defense network. Yeah. Um, and then of course, um, all the telecom, we used uh, Cisco uh, VoIP phones, uh, had Cisco call manager servers. And then all the infrastructure that went with it. I mean, throughout the, the MOD, it was a really, really big building. So, yeah. um, you know, we had, to, we had to build out. That was a big, yeah. big building. It was, huge. it was unique. It was a unique building for sure. I mean, it was beautiful. Right. Um, I mean, dude, at the time, I was working for the U.S. intelligence as an intelligence asset. I was the command sergeant major in the MOD. And I'm already dealing with the intel guys. And in the middle of it, I think the first person I said was Dave. Dave was the first person I encountered in the building. And I was kind of like, I was like, who are these civilians and long bearded civilians walking around on their own with like some of them with guns, some of them with no guns. And I'm like, who are these motherfuckers? And then at the time they were explaining like, oh, these are like guys who are going to be in charge of the internet. And it was the first time Iraqis getting access to the internet. This was a new thing. Oh, for God. Us. Yeah. Most of us <laughs> never saw a computer or a Pontium 3 in our, in our lives. And right. here they are. There's three Americans out there providing this with this magical service called Internet. I mean, shit, man. Um, at the time, everybody wanted to kiss your ass because this was like. Yeah, it was great. Magical. Like make nice with the IT guys because they're going to give us yeah. phones and, and Internet. Uh, that it was it was a lot. It was a tall order. We had to you know build out the whole building, right? I mean, all new yeah. new gear, new equipment. Uh, the jock, you know, you remember the jock yeah. the Joint Operations yeah, Center? Yeah, I remember that, the jock the operations like, center, the yeah. Iraqi military operational center. That was like a theater before, and we converted that into the the yep, place I have where pictures of it to this day. Yeah, like like basically where the war was was run from. You know what I mean? Like that yep. was it was important. It was huge. It was um, the only place where you walk into, you can see all Iraqi troops in contact, like yep. in contact, like yep. you walk into that building or that theater room. And it was at the time we had 10th Iraqi divisions. We have about 10 divisions at the time. And you will see all the 10 divisions, the casualties, the, the, the that's what the, that's what the operations did. They actually reported the next morning about the situation of the Iraqi army. Perhaps most of people and most of the military members really don't know how bad we were losing the war until yeah. about you walk into this room and you look at the screen and you see how other units are getting messed up. And you're like, crap, like I'm not really having it as bad compared to the seventh Iraqi division that's in Fallujah that oh, is losing uh, seven people in each platoon a day. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But back to your story and how. I met you, dude, 
at the time, it took me about literally three months trying to figure you out. <laughs> was, three months trying yeah. to figure out who the fuck is this guy? Who he there works were, for? Yeah. There and were like, a lot of just rumors, like, man. And I couldn't no. believe it. Like, so as the rest of the Rockies. They were like, this is not an IT dude. These bearded guys. Uh, and then I remember this story. Dave, which was one of your ITs, right. who was actually a former Marine. Right. At the time, they were questioning Dave so much in the MOD. Like, what do you do, man? And, you know, Dave will come in. He's a little skinny, red, redhead ginger guy with a long red beard. He'll come in wearing glasses, civilian clothes, like khakis and a military boot. And they were questioning Dave. They were drilling Dave. Who do you work for? Are you CIA? Are you DIA? Are you FBI? And Dave pulls in his wallet and he shows a Marine Corps like ID. And he goes, I was in the Marines. And all these Iraqis were like, yeah, these motherfuckers are planning CIA guys so they could watch us. And then the salt, like to add more salt to the plate. It was you walking around with that little AK in your hand and a body armor. <laughs> and that was sealed it. That was like sealed the conspiracy theory because all the other real CIA guys in the building did not look anything like the CIA. Uh, the IT guys did actually look like a CIA operative. And the conspiracy theory was it was only three of you guys, right? It was three of you, three Americans. That's right. Right. It was Steve, Dave, and you. And they were like, well, they're by themselves. But do you think they're really by themselves? Do you believe if someone approached them that will be helicopters coming out of the bathroom? Or <laughs> some commandos <laughs> are going to come out? I'm like, are they armed? Like, what's going on? And I, I would never forget the conspiracy theory going around with Iraqis who, who are basically conspiracy theory drunk because they lived under Saddam for 35 right. years. I mean... The assumptions they made of you, bro, as a 26-year-old white American, shit, man. They made all kind of yeah. horrible assumptions. Yeah, I mean, I had, I mean, I, I was, you know, supposedly had five girlfriends and yeah. um, was going to all these parties and was uh, either CIA or Mossad. And, I mean, the yep. stories were just crazy. If I yep. even had, you know, 20% of the fun that everybody <laughs> thought I was having, uh, that would have been something. The Mossad you know I mean? rumor, like, that was worse. Because, you know, if yeah. you were like a, a Jewish Mossad, that's worse than being a CIA in their book. Of course, of course yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and the I reason why, that. here's what the rumor that came around. So I'm collecting information on certain individuals in the MOD. And then the rumors comes around that um, you are actually of an Arabic descent, that you are an Arab, undercover Arab. And the reason why, because you spoke Iraqi dialect to them, you said a couple words, and they freaked out, and they said, you know what? This motherfucker is not white. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean he's not white? He's as white as anything. And they're like, no, this motherfucker is not white. This motherfucker is CIA, and he's an Arabic dude. He's listening to everything we're doing. So they decided to not say anything in front of you anymore because they totally believed you were fluent in the language. Well, it, it, and they asked me, I got asked point blank, especially by guys in the jock and, and, and even some of the, just the regular soldiers guard in the place. Like, Hey, you can tell me, right. Are, are you CIA or something like that? Like, no, I'm not at all. Just a regular guy. Like, yeah. yeah. That's exactly what somebody with the CIA would say. I'm like, <laughs> you know, man, believe what you're going to believe it, You know, we're, we're good. But I mean, I, the first thing I, I saw, that's where the whole game of Thrones kind of Thing started uh, i saw all the people yeah. vying for power and the attention from the minister and what departments were faring better than others and um since everything was run on uh, you know cisco call manager i w yeah. i had a, a detailed list of all the mac addresses for every phone and what that phone went to to the staff general to this guy with the air force to whatever i had the whole place mapped out uh with the phones and so I had this program called uh, Observer made by a company called Network Instruments, and it does exactly what it sounds like. It observes. So you can flag like the minister's phone and his chief yeah. staff and da da da. And whenever they pick up the phone, it starts recording their conversation to an MP3. Yeah. And so I, I was listening 
and of course the Arabic conversations I had Shauki with me to translate, but I was listening to, to everything of, of, of anybody who was anybody, I was listening to all their phone calls. Now this, you know, that wasn't, you know, sanctioned by any entity. I just realized that the place was a den of vipers. You know, there were. It was not one of your CIA missions. <laughs> no, no, but I, 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 I had to know, I had to know yeah. like but, as but much as I could. You lived yeah. Right. Right. I mean, the, it was a dangerous place, right? It, it uh, as you know, right. It, there were a yeah. lot of bad guys and, and it, that were there. And you know, you, you were like listening to basically the dirty, you know, like the kind of dirty, the undercover dirty business that there was being conducted because of the time you got all these terrorist organizations that are pointing people in the ministry. Um, at the time, the department and Navy got hijacked by a guy that was loyal to Iran. Um, that the, the other departments were being hijacked by certain people. The guy that hijacked the, the, the Department of Communication has a loyalty to um, has a loyalty to a group that assassinated other officers in the MOD that were not loyal to their group. I mean, the whole place in general, as the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, was a shit show because it's the biggest budget in the country. Every right. single right. person in the politics wanted a piece of that pie and here you are the only american that would be controlling the most newest technology in the country called internet and um dude when when all these computers were around the mod this was a new tool these people were like finding things out and not to not mention the story is like at a certain point i remember the minister of defense got a threat a threatening email someone threatening him from an email inside of the MOD system. So the threat did not come from a Yahoo account. The threat right. comes from an MOD email, which freaked the shit out of, right? We were like, imagine you're the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. You're at your ministry, and this is your command ship. And someone sends you a threat email. Al-Qaeda sends you a threat email from your own from building. Inside. That's freaky. It was oh, stupid, God. though. Like, what a stupid move, you know? That, like, I, if is. I remember... We we isolated the the department that that came from, if I recall correctly. Yeah, and uh, and that just put all eyes on on that group of people. So it it yep. was really a not a very strategic move on their part. Um, we all shut down the room at the time, by the way. We all did. Do I know? I was there. I was there at the minister's office when they when they uh, made the call, and I ran downstairs, and it was a a, a two room, part of one of the departments to the right wing of the of the building and they say i remember it was either you or one of you guys said this is where it came from that's the room and it had about six or seven computers in it right yeah i mean it, it uh was very easy to to find out you know the origin of that communication um you know the yahoo thing that was a little bit more difficult whenever whenever we did that um which is great i've, I've got to i've got to actually track down that video um uh, uh, the minister made a video. Uh, I shot it uh, with my camera. Uh, of he was, you know, had a background. I think it was an Iraqi flag, and you know, yeah. he, he opened with, you know, "Salam alaikum" and da da da, and uh, went on to talk about how, you know, the the American illegal occupation uh, of Iraq must cease, and uh, we demand that America free all uh, Iraqi prisoners in Abu Ghraib and Bukha in the south and da 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 just all these these crazy demands that the, his people that had kidnapped his i guess his chief of staff's 12 year old son they had yeah. all these demands that as part of the ransom that they wanted this tape broadcast in the news and they they were going to get it to the news but i had to, to start make the this video. story over to start this no. story over i don't mean to cut you off that start no, the story no. over you actually made the iraqi minister do minister of defense do this video intentionally yeah yeah it was it was great um course i had no intention of of giving it to the, the kidnappers right um yeah but it was a way you know at the time as you know uh internet had just come to iraq and there were no yeah. there was no fiber optic networks there were no i mean there was barely any functioning landlines uh the only way to get internet in iraq was via satellite yeah and uh via eu sat and so uh, that's how we connected all the bases they were all sat up and so Baghdad, you know, a city of 8 million people, 
only has a handful of internet cafes, though. Not many. I mean, it's super yep. expensive. You know, the power Very was limited. always unreliable at Dura, so you had to have your own generators and UPSs and all that. The gear is is pricey. The data plans are super expensive, but there were people who were able to afford it and make a you know a living having these these internet cafes. So the chief of staff for the minister gets an email to his MOD email. Yeah. So that was that was like hmm, okay, so they they know that much. Um, from this, it was like x x x y y y y underscore x x whatever at yahoo.com. Like totally anonymous, right? And yeah. so, um, so the video or the email demands like uh, they say that they've they've got the twelve year old boy. They want two hundred thousand dollars in done? cash, huh? Yeah, his yeah, son. It, it was twelve year old yeah. son. Yep, that was kidnapped. Holy, yep. man. I mean, I can't imagine, they wanted, bro. Like two hundred thousand or two fifty. I can't remember exactly how much. And then um, they wanted a video made by the minister of defense, who was at the time it was uh, Sadun uh, Abdelami. Abdelami. And um, so they wanted the videos, you know, denouncing the American occupation of Iraq, demanding that all the prisoners, you know, be freed and just a whole bunch of other crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, and you can't really you can't do that. It's a video that can't be made. But I, I said, look, we have to make this video. All right. I'm going to make the video and then yeah. I'm going to encode it. But it's going to be all jar- jarbled and blah, blah, blah. They'll be able to see you say, you know, uh, salam, salam alaikum. And then yeah. it's going to be, you know, and, and messed up. And, uh, and then I'll compress it, and then I will send it to, to this email address. Because, uh, I mean, you can't send a huge attachment, right? So I had to compress the hell out of it. Um, and, of course, I, it was all completely messed up anyways, So which is the intent. I, I wanted them to reply. I just I wanted them to reply. Yep. They didn't know um, your so, skill at the time. They didn't know what else the internet has. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they didn't I guess. Know. I mean, it, it, it didn't take it didn't take a lot of skills yeah. to like track these guys down, right? It just uh, I sent the video off, and these idiots, you know, went into the same internet cafe and responded from that same address. And so um, I got a hold of the uh, the provider, and they have like a knock in Switzerland. I, I'm trying to remember. It's like direct way or something like that was the, the provider and uh they were able to, to track down the account that it came from and the internet ca- cafe that it came from and they immediately sent uh, a, a qrf uh to that location yeah. and they they got the guy that was sitting there on the internet and um that led them to the uh, the boy and the boy was rescued yeah, too, the guy's the son boy. um so it was, a, it was a really successful operation, and yeah. uh, but I still have that tape. Yeah. I still have that tape somewhere. I'm gonna have to, because that you know, that'll be for like private sharing, or whatever. But it'll be it'll be yeah. interesting. So you can see you know the minister sitting there saying all this crazy stuff. Yeah, um, it was crazy uh, because you got the minister of defense to actually the Iraqi minister of defense asking his own ally, "You need to leave the country." That would have been a disaster. Right. But I think it was oh, a yeah. good move on your part. It was a great move in your part because if they saw the minister of defense replying to them, most likely they would be excited that they got his intention, and then they would reply out. Sure. How long did it take them to actually reply to the video? Oh man, it was the next day. Yeah, like they like day, replied man. immediately. Yeah. They're like, "Fuck, yeah, we got to respond." <laughs> yeah, and and I so I I, I kept ping ponging back with them. I'm like, "Oh, yeah." Okay, so I'm sorry. We, you know, we really want this to work. We've got the video. Let me try again, and I would just send them the same file again, and they would reply back, "No, yeah. it's 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 still it's still jarbled." Okay, okay, you give me like let let me reencode it. Fifteen yeah. minutes, just fifteen minutes, and that was enough time for the cure. <laughs> Rough to, to, to to go there to the internet cafe and like. Gotcha. It'll be like knock knock. You know, there's the SF guys outside. <laughs> right. Right. Hey, I mean, was... I mean, dude, I got to give you credit, man. That day you made a lot of people happy and you saved a life. You saved the life of a little boy that was had been um, a victim in the middle of you know, Al Qaeda cell or whatever. And I mean, they had no idea they were dealing with the most dangerous, hectic, reckless IT in the world. <laughs> they were like. They just, they just didn't realize the person across the line was more dangerous than they are. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, you you have to be a little crazy there, right? You know, 
like Alice yeah, in Wonderland. Too. We're all mad here, right? But yeah, uh, you, if you're gonna survive, you gotta be gotta be a little nutty. I mean, it, it was the MOD was the most dangerous place and the most safe place. Yeah, in my opinion, uh, it, it had two sides of you know of, of the same coin. For instance, yeah, my my quarters. That's how it was. Yeah, and, and my official. A uh, trailer was back at the embassy, back behind the embassy where yep. they had hundreds I of remember. these trailers. And that's where I was supposed to go every night. But the guys from across the river were playing, you know, bing, uh, trailer bingo with mortars. Mortars and every so, day. Yeah. yeah. And so you would hear, oh, yeah, the guy in the trailer four down just got, you know, wasted last night sleeping. So what was yeah. the answer? Oh, they, they, they walled up every trailer with sandbags. That way, whenever your trailer got blown up, it didn't blow yeah. anybody else up. And it's like, well, that makes me sleep a lot easier at night. You know? Yeah, because then if you um, die, you just die alone. No one has right, to die Right, right. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? This really isn't, yeah. isn't for me. I hate this bingo Hard game. It's, it's a sick yeah. bingo game. So that's whenever I converted that, that um, IDF slash vault room. It was above the jock, above the Joint Operations Center at the MOD. No one even knew that room existed. Uh, exactly, exactly. It was like an and room. so I secured it. Um, had a kitchenette in there. I had bunk beds. So the rest of my team that wanted to stay Here's overnight the crazy stay. Part. The crazy it, part is that we had Iranian operatives in the building. We have members mm -hmm. of Al Qaeda. We had members of the Naksha Bendis. We have members of the Battle Corps. We have every single terrorist cell in the country in that building. And not one single motherfucker knew you were sleeping there. Yeah. I mean, it, it was great. <laughs> Nobody it was great. knew. They're like, it's all dumb. Even when you invited me over, bro. Like I was in the building and, you know, me and you, our relationship was like not official. Like I was a military guy. I'm, I'm working as an intelligent asset. Obviously you didn't have any idea about that at the time, what I was doing. And I met you when I met you, I was like, you were kind of like the one friend that I've been waiting for to have, right? Like I needed oh, to have some yeah. personal life in my life being there 24 hours. I don't go home. I'm from Baghdad. And when I met you, that's when all the wild shit took off, right? That's when I, <laughs> I was young. I was like 19, yeah, going on yeah. 20, never Fresh done anything face, young guy. in my life. I was like, you know, crazy is that I was doing all these crazy, dangerous jobs. I was like being an undercover asset for an agency inside of an Iraqi department. And then I have never had fun in my life. I never done anything fun until one day you walked in and you looked at me and you were like, do you want to go to a wedding? And I was like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I was oh, like, the infamous wedding. wedding? Who? And you were like, there's a wedding here in the hotel. At the Rashid, man, go which is like, drink. nice. Hey, dude, it was my first time after literally two years of war to take my uniform off, put on civilian clothes. I went and got a jeans and a t shirt. Yep. And. And I went, you were like, you can't go in uniform, so you got to go get some clothes. And I went and got a jeans, a T-shirt, and I went out for the night in the middle of a combat zone. I mean, the hotel was still in the green zone. Yeah. You drove, and <laughs> I trusted you. It was my, my mistake, right? <laughs> oh, come on. You were oh, like, come on, come on dude. You're going to go have fun. And, dude, it was, it was Hem Says Wedding. Hem Says and Jeff. That's right. That's right. And Rob. And it, it was Rob. an American Hamsen guy Rob. married an Iraqi girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And dude, it, it's funny that they're still married to this day. They got kids. They live in upstate New York. They are. And, yeah, they're, they're doing well. And and, uh, and it's like, I get invited, and I had no idea who the hell is Jeff, who she is. I had no idea. I just I'm just there in the wedding, and you get us up to dance in the <laughs> middle of that wedding. I think we danced in that <laughs> wedding more than anybody else. <laughs> More than her own family. We had, we had the whole <laughs> circle going and, and the leg kick. Yeah, I got leg videos kick, of that and, shit. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, got yeah. videos of it, bro. Me it too. was just funny. It was like, and, and you know, we, we have people who were with us that day. They unfortunately died in, 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 yeah. in explosions in Baghdad and didn't make it. Some of your guys that died over there, uh, like Abu Tabarak and all these amazing guys we had. I mean, dude, when I look at these videos, I cry, man, because I see like, these people that were part of our lives and yeah. one day they get out of the wire and then they never come back. And then you, next thing you hear, they died. They didn't make it. it. And it was so tough. Like every tough time, day, you know, and, and it, it's something that people and hopefully more people will learn about through this conversation. But uh, especially the guys that, that 
went home to their families every day. They yeah. had they had you know the insurgents and Iranians and all these other groups were watching all the gates that went in and out and who went in and out of the green zone. I and mean, we were they there. They were inside of the MOD, literally watching yeah, everybody. That's leaving. right. Yeah. And and we were there. At, remember, it's, it was called Assassin's Gate. That was the the main yep. gate next Assassin's to the MOD. Gate, yep. And it was the most dangerous gate, uh, in in the green zone. It was. I mean, constantly getting hit. You know, suicide car bombers. Which, where, suicide where did I stand bombers. every single day in my life? At that gate. At that gate. At it's that crazy. Gate. Yep. And I don't it, know and how I you got did it. You, man. I, you remember all the black banners mm -hmm. on the MOD? And a black banner it means someone died. Mm -hmm. And one day, I come in and I still, I, and actually I was either heading to your office or something, and I'm about to walk in and I see nothing but a black banners all the way up to the top of the building. Yeah. Names and names of Iraqi people, yep. Iraqi officers, civilian employees. They left have their the picture and then the black band gate. on it. Picture, black yeah. band, picture, black. I mean, left it, that it was just... gate and were killed immediately. Yep. And at that point, I knew I couldn't get out of the wire. Like, I knew there were, I would never go home. And I never did. I never went home. And when I saw that, I'm like, literally, I'm right standing right here in the gate. I'm getting hit by a car bomb and a suicide bomber every single day. And if I leave this wire to go home to my own family, it will be the end. Because I am literally looking at my assassin somewhere, and I don't know who it is. My That's assassin. Right. And Unknown. I mean, the, the guys were telling me stories. This is their daily routine, right? They would leave the MOD, yeah. and they would take a taxi to some random part of town that not where they lived. And then they would go to yeah. a market there, and then they'd get another taxi to another place. And then they get because, another yeah. different taxi from there to get back to their house. And then in the morning, they would repeat that and change in the routes all the time. And yeah. people doing this six days a week, I mean, that's dedication. People have asked me in the past, hey, you know, you brought so many of your team over. Like, how do you know yeah. they're not, you know, sleeper terrorists or blah, 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 yeah. or say some ignorant stuff like that? I'm yeah. like, look, man, I trust these people more than probably anybody in the world next to my family and my wife. Like, yeah. these people put it on the line every day. To make and, it to and, work. And, uh, yeah, just to come to work. And if that's not dedication and loyalty and trust, I mean, like, what is? Uh, and, and you know, a few of them paid with, with their life, fortunately. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my so, hands used to be on my heart every day when I see your guys leave the checkpoint, man. And Speaking of, were you out there the day that the guy blew himself up? He had the grenade vest on, and he yeah, blew himself up. This is the generals were leaving. Checkpoint. Yeah. Oh, my God. So I, mean, I, I was... I just walked the guys out there because, you know, they they would yeah. walk across the bridge to Baba Shirji. Yeah, that was my point. Yep. And just as yep. uh, it was some it was some generals, right? They were in those Kia uh, minivans, I believe yep. it was. And um, they were just I, mean, I have some horrific video from that incident. But uh, yeah. I was out there. I had my camera with me, but I, I had my little my little shorty AK that uh, that the minister had given me. Yeah. Um, and I always that never left my side. They call side. it the Bin Laden. That's what they call yeah, it. Yeah, the Bin Laden. Yeah, or the, I think the Russians call it the Krinkov or Stuchka, something like that. Dude, I was yeah. when I was there at the checkpoint, and something would goes on. Right, usually all the Americans in that area or that circle would run out of the circle, would literally just get away. Right. Sure. As soon as something sure. goes, I mean, I was there. This was my checkpoint. These were my soldiers, and every day I would see shit goes on, and I'll see everybody runs away. And you were the only white person will come through with a camera trying to fucking film something. <laughs> and I was like, well, I mean, hey, I was ready to go. I was ready for anything. I had my yeah. camera. I had my my AK. I had my battle rattle on. Um, this day, you know, I I would go. I like I said, I have hundreds of hours of tape from almost five years uh, being there, and I videoed everything. I videoed the boring stuff. I videoed the good stuff, yeah. the beautiful stuff, the evil stuff, the ugly stuff. I videoed yeah. it all. Uh, just because I knew people were never going to believe all these stories. And I was out there yeah. just going to video wow. another day in the life of the green zone. And yeah. Shalky's there with me and some other guys are getting ready to leave. And that convoy passes by and that dude walking across from Baba Shirji on the bridge just all of a sudden yeah. takes a, a detour, like straight up to the, the yep. convoy. And, the boom. Yep. and I, I remember the explosion. And yeah. then, and then of course, you know, it's, super loud my ears were pretty shot by that point anyways but imagine um, i was in the front checkpoint when that went off yeah, yeah i mean, well, certainly i felt the barrier was gonna fall on me 
so I'm checking, I'm checking Shauki and them, and I'm like, hey, are you yeah. all right? You're all right. And there's like, there's, there's like little, they're bleeding from like all these spots and stuff. I'm like, oh no, it's frag or you know, there's some, you, you got hit. It wasn't, Crap. it wasn't their blood, you know. It was, uh, it was that Someone guy's. Else. And I mean, I, I had little bits of bio all over. I had a, it was a brand new uniform, and I'm yeah. like, I'm like, oh man, uh, this is, this is terrible. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I now I just I just got this from the cleaners. Don't remember <laughs> and I was I was like backing up. I'm like, guys, come on, come on, back up, because there were still live grenades with the pen out live that I guess hadn't exploded all over the place. And I'm like, back up, come on, let's let's get inside the checkpoint. Yeah. And uh, my foot went squish, and I, I looked down, yeah. and it was part of the guy's lungs. You know, I was standing in lungs. I'm like, Jesus, wow. Um, so, but you know, you got to keep a. I remember. I, I know I have the one picture that you sent me. Um, in a particular incident that actually someone had a sticky bomb in their car. It was an Iraqi judge. And you came out and you took a picture of it. It was actually an Iraqi judge that had someone stick a bomb under his car. And I don't know why. I think he has prosecuted some guys or something. And he passed by me leaving the checkpoint and got to the middle of the bridge and that's when he went off. That's Ooh. when it blew up. And his his security details didn't even know, man. I mean, that's when they were really good with the sticky bombs. That's when they were right. really sticking bombs right under your car. And this was an Iranian made. This was like a a very well arranged assassinations they were conducting. Sure. And you know, you know someone personally that died in those. Nabil, you remember Nabil, Captain Nabil? He died in I one do. of those, man. I do. They put one in his BMW right under him, and he, he poor guy, he, he died in it. And uh, that thing was powerful, man. That was extremely, I mean, you know, it's a military made bomb. And if you didn't have a mirror, if your PSD security personnel did not have a mirror to check the bottom of your car at all times, or they don't pay attention or a bunch of, of their bunch of stupid guys, they're not real protection or they're your cousins and you just hired them up to right. be your protection. Right. That guy paid the price that day. And that day, literally, I was so scared to ride in any car when I saw it. I was like, damn, when he blew up, I mean, he, he literally f got fried. Like, oh, yeah, there's nothing, the nothing left. Nothing. He got fried. Like, yep. I mean, it was so yep. bad. And I was like, how big of a bomb this had to be? And how did they, how the craft of how to stick this thing under a car without even noticing? That was like just insanity, man. And, and you had taken a picture of that. I mean, shit. And I, and I always wonder, and I'm like, why is this dude carrying a camera trying to film this? You were there before CNN every time something went off. I, I had unfettered access to the country. I mean, really, I, 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 the, you know, reporters were usually embedded with a unit and there's only certain things yeah. they could video or whatever. I just, wherever I went, I kind of did what I wanted to do and uh, nobody ever asked questions. So I'm like, well, okay, it works for me. Um, so yeah, I took advantage of it. I, you know, I knew that I would get some really unique insight. And again, yeah. if, if you come home and you tell these stories, you know, people are going to think in the back of their head, you know, like, yeah. yeah, you went fishing and the fish was this big, but you don't have a picture, yeah. right? You actually filmed and the documentary. So, yeah, I, I, I got it on tape. That way, I don't have to tell the story. I can just narrate the video, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, yeah. The documentation so, is amazing. Like, what you have documented. It is. Because people, whenever I mean, the they only, see it, they're like. The only two people had cameras in the MOD was me and you. You had a camera, and you, I think you gave me one at some point, And I started like taking all these pictures a little Sony, and a little Sony video, digital camera, yeah. little Sony digital camera. I think you yep. gave it to me. Yep. That's right. And I, I really just like, I couldn't own a camera. It was like 200, $300 to own one. And yeah, man, it, it was just a wild times. And the things that were happening in the front checkpoint, the, the crazy shit. I mean, to this day, I tell these stories. It's unbelievable. You were being attacked every single day of your life of left and right. And the casualties, the people that die every single day that leave in front of you saying goodbye to you, I'll see you tomorrow, and then they don't then, come back. Yeah, they don't come back. And you have that feeling like, I think they're dead. Well, yeah, it's a horrible feeling. But there's another feeling, too, that I, I'm sure, I mean, you actually spent a lot more time out at that checkpoint than I ever did. And But every time I went out there, I, I don't know how, how to explain it. It was like needles or something it does like every you could feel or sense every hair on your body like yeah. with the awareness and the and the heightened like hey man yeah. this is really dangerous and like something yeah. could go down any second 
and it wasn't fearful. You know, it wasn't like you were uh, scared or afraid. And there's nothing wrong with that. That sometimes can save your life. But uh, it was just this this super heightened sense of alert. You know, I mean, um, every day, man, every day when I wake up and go to the checkpoint in the morning and I look at every single face of my soldiers and I look at my I look at their face and I wonder and I said, who am I going to lose today? Which one of these guys are going to go? And especially like, you know, the first two guys that usually search the pedestrian, the personnel. And you, I got guys on the, le- on the right side who search cars and everything. This is, where, this is literally what I lost most people were either in the pedestrian line or the vehicle line. And maybe you wonder, I'm like, which one of my guys is going to die today? Is it the pedestrian line going to have a suicide bomber blow himself up? Is it the vehicle line where a car bomb is going to go off? And I would never forget the look when I had to tell one of these soldiers, it is your turn to go there at 7 a.m. in the morning. Because they know 7 to 7.30 a.m., that is the bombing time. And I would never forget the look when I'm telling one of my soldiers older and them saying, you're going to the left gate. You're standing searching pedestrians. That's what you're doing. And I'll never forget the look, the look of death. That you're telling someone that you're going there, you might you might not come back, and it's just I felt so bad and guilty that I would actually go stand there with them. I mean, I to their credit, up. though, yeah. they they did. Yeah. You know, you had a good group yeah. group of guys there. They the yeah. guys were were rock hard. You know, they would go out yeah. there and they knew that it could come at any second. And they're like, well, you know, another day at the office. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, dude, yeah. the, the place, the feeling. I mean, one day. We had a drunk guy at eight, at eight in the evening. You know, in Karada, there was all the alcohol guys, right? Where they sold sure, alcohol. Yeah, right there. Trust me. I... <laughs> so, so, what so, a dude goes there, a rocket gets there, gets fucking wasted drunk, and start coming walking past the checkpoint. So me and three of my soldiers, I'm going out there for the last check of the night to check on my guys before I really go to bed and get ready for the next day. And all of a sudden we're standing by the bunker to the left side of the gate. If you remember, there's a little bunker yep. Yep. and there was like a BMB one, uh, the, the tank and a dude comes out of nowhere, out of the dark. And it was a little short, chubby dude. And he just comes running. So the moment we see him in the dark, we thought it was a suicide bomber. Right. So me and the four soldiers go in four different directions. Right? I fell in the process. lucky he didn't get shot. (laughs) Literally, I fell in the process. And when I fell, I pointed my handgun, my, my, my Walter P99. I pull it out, and I had hella points in it. I would have blown his face off. Right. And I pull it off. I put it on him. And he fell right in front of me. At that point, I was just about an inch from shooting him. And he just He's fell so on his face lucky, man. and didn't move. And, bro, when we got up and we're, like, literally didn't even touch him. We were trying to process, right? Is he going to blow up? Is he going off? Nothing. Nothing yet. So we get up and one of my soldiers go, oh, shit. He, this is a drunk motherfucker. And, and as soon as we smell the alcohol... I mean, you're talking about the four soldiers, including me, were beating the shit out of this guy. Literally. Yeah, we I mean, just- I, I, I remember the incident, I, I, and I, I thought that it was an MOD employee, right? Didn't he work uh, No, there? he was he was just a, like a, a guy who worked in the green zone. Okay, all right, yeah, because I remember he, 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 had, he had some kind of badge that allowed him access, but yeah. yeah, he just ran blind drunk in. I remember he got in all sorts of trouble. Um, dude, I mean, and, yeah. we beat the shit out of him. Like we literally grilled him because I thought he was a suicide bomber. And when we found out he was drunk, all these other soldiers, man, their heart went out of their fucking pants. Um, they they thought that was it. And then it's like the the moment you know he's in the ground, he's facing up down in the ground, and all of us are like, and me holding the the Pulsar P ninety nine in his face, and I'm waiting for him to blow up, and I'm like, well, he didn't go off, and he just didn't move. He was completely wasted, and and the shit that you would see every single day in that checkpoint was oh, horrific. That away from the explosion and everything, you will see some of these contractors come out to checkpoint one trying to escort prostitutes. Oh, yeah. Iraqi prostitutes. In. And I will yeah. be, I'll be the counselor to go it's in like, and say, hey, sir, 
Uh, Not happening. She may have STD. She may have AIDS. Uh, are you sure you really want to escort this person? <laughs> uh, this is my temporary secretary for like a day. <laughs> oh, uh, trust me, I had a talk with one contractor for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and he did not want to admit the fact that he was escorting a prostitute. And I'm like, dude, I'm from this country. I know who this bitch is. This isn't a prostitute. And are you positive you're going to escort her inside of the base? I said, do you know the risk you're taking by letting her in? In 20 minutes, he told me she was the cleaner for the company. I said, look, man, I know she's not the cleaner. I know you're, where, where you're trying to Cleaning go. I don't something. care what you're trying to do. And then I said, well, what if she works for people and she's trying to get coordinates of what all the locations are? Sure. He's like, oh. I said, yeah, you'll be responsible. And yep. he goes, well, we don't have to do anything tonight. I said, all right, well, uh, we'll take her out of here. And I will really escort her out. I'm like, bitch, if you come back here again, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> and it's well, talking about That's, talking that's about the, the shit that you saw every day, man. Every the, day. The green, the green zone, I think, uh, like so I mentioned earlier, whenever I got that call, right, the first call about the guy that got his head cut off. And I'm like, anybody that goes into the green zone, I mean, outside the green zone into Baghdad proper without a convoy yeah. or escort or whatever is an idiot. Like, of course, you're going to either get kidnapped or killed, right? And so um, this one night, Chowky says, hey, man, um, it's, it's the weekend because, you know, the weekend is it's Thursday there, right? And he's like, hey, why don't you come to my house? And stay the night. Yeah, I'm like, wait, and like outside the green zone in Baghdad. He's like, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like that. real Baghdad's. Like, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And so I, I had a dish dash. So I put the dish dash on, and I had the shemag. I put that on, and then um, I had a pelican case with my the shorty AK in it with a drum mag on it, and um, we went and. Got a taxi and went to this and house. You spend the night in a town that's pretty much controlled by thicken militias. Yeah. It, and it was... when they told me you actually spend the night at Shaki's house, I fucking was like, what the fuck? Like, you know, like you're in a white, you're a white American and in the middle of a war zone and you go out, this is the fucking Iraqi town. But the, the thing is, is that you were so invented with Iraq that you knew all the, the tricks and games and everything. You blend it so well that nobody even knew there was an American. Nobody even spin. looked at me. <laughs> nobody even. The only, the only eyebrows I got raised, you know, they had those checkpoints every so often throughout Baghdad. And, and I, yeah. it was usually MOI guys that were manning those. And, uh, and we roll up to an MOI ch- uh, checkpoint and they're asking me for my Jinsia. And of course, I don't have a national Iraqi card. And yeah. so I just show them my embassy badge. Like, and they're like, yeah. Okay, and they wave us on through. And they're and, like, "What man, the fuck I, is this dude doing here by himself?" I, right. I had a great time that night. Like the, their their yeah. neighbors like saw me come in, and everybody kept it hush hush. And we had a yeah. great dinner. I slept there overnight. I actually there's video of me that Shauki took of me. Yeah. I, I fell asleep on my mat with holding my AK like this on my pillow, yeah. and just you know, it's just ready to go. Like that. You're not kidnapping I'll me. Be- I'm not going to be in a video. Dude, um, that was bold. That was bold move dude, for you to go spend the night at your Iraqi interpreter's house and just my God, if if, in. if if the embassy or if Minsticky or the the RSO at the embassy got word of that, I would have been out of country. You know, oh, they would have kicked you. The sh- they they, they um, would have even they wouldn't even have talked to you. They would have kicked you out of the country immediately. Yeah. But that's the beauty yeah. of man. What you were doing is always about what was wild and and you just did what you believed on and. And you embedded so well with your guys that they were willing to give their lives to protect you. And I would not doubt either one of them. They just treated you as their own. Uh, right. And you were no longer an American. You were just like one of the crew guys, right? Another you one of the guys. And, um, dude, this was an epic episode. I, I know down the road I have to bring you down more for this. But this was a beautiful episode that I think the audience is going to enjoy because this is a side of the Iraq war that people never heard about. And especially the, the crazy jobs that you were involved in, the things you got involved in, the difference you made in that war, the people you helped and brought home, which we can touch on a different episode. Sure. Um, a lot of things that, to talk about. But before we close this, is there anything you want to say that, to the audience about your experience? Yeah, I mean, what do they say? It was the best of times and the worst of times um it it 
really was an eye opener to me. Uh, I'll just just briefly, whenever I, I I first got there and and was Najaf was the first place I spent a significant amount of time at. Uh, I didn't know much Arabic yet, and so it's amazing the communication you can do by drawing in the sand with people. And uh, a common thing that or question I got asked was they would write one nine nine one and a question mark, and they'd say why. And of course, we all know what wow. happened in '91, like with the Gulf War. And I yeah. so eventually I got Shauki to translate, you know, because there's some things you cannot figure out in the dirt. And uh, it's like they want to know why, you know, Bush said to rise up against Saddam. And so the Shiites in the South did that. And then the Iraqi military came in and slaughtered. Them. And, and then uh, America didn't do and anything. And America right. didn't lift a finger to help them, they just left them to hang out yeah. to dry like that. And so why? So that was a question I got asked early on. And that was always present in my mind, kind of like, you know, maybe the story that, that we've been told and the history that we've been told all these years isn't really the truth. And uh, so that's when I started questioning things. And then all the missteps, like I, like I told you earlier, how, you know, Bremer and these guys, a coalitional provisional yeah. authority, um, left all these bases on guard, you know? Yeah. Like and and then and then uh put all the Iraqi soldiers out of work, you know, overnight, disbanded the army. Things like that. These series of just horrible decisions that were turning the country into hell. Um yeah. needlessly. It did not need to happen that way. Um it really got me questioning things. I went over there like, Yeah, we're gonna get Saddam like yeah. the like the good sheep I was, right? And then after about six months there, I was like, oh no. Um, this, this might've been a mistake. Uh, yeah. so yeah, it was very eye opening for me. Um, the, the way I gauged it, it was, it was, you know, there were great times or it was really tough. Uh, at other times I, I knew one day I wanted to be married and you know, I get married and I wanted to have a family. And so I, I told myself if I can make it through this, then I can, I can be a good father. You know, I, I can handle anything that life ready. throws at me, you know, like if I can make it through this and come out alive, um, then I can handle anything. And so that it was kind of like I was trying to prove to myself that I could I could do it and uh had some close calls uh numerous occasions uh but you know I I, I made it through and I kept getting back on the horse. You know that I was told even at one point like hey you know if you want to you want to go yeah. everybody would understand. I was like no I'm 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 going to stay here. It became your land and it became your people and it became a place that you really couldn't leave. And um, I think I ended up leaving the country before you because I left in uh, July 2008. I think you stayed there longer, didn't you? No, I, I, I think I was out around, it was either January or February. So oh, I, I, I might have been the yeah, one yeah, that was out. Like two or three months before. Yep. That's right. Yep. That's right. And I man, I tell you, the hole that it left in my heart whenever I, I yeah. left. I felt like yeah. I was leaving my brothers and my family behind. Yeah. And uh, I came back to the States. Like, I didn't go back to New Orleans because the, the place where yeah. in my my apartment there and everything had been hit with Katrina. And I, I had broken up yeah. with my girlfriend. I didn't have anything to go back to. So I, I came back to Houston and uh, didn't really know anybody, you know. And so yeah. every day I, I was just sad and, like, really missing the camaraderie, missing you guys. Uh, yeah. It was such a, a big Martin. part of my life. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was really we all, tough. We all went through a depression, man. We all went yeah. through a depression leaving that environment yeah. because it, it, it was such a different environment. We, we came here and it was like quiet. That's what hit me so hard. Yeah. It was so quiet. And we got used to this craziness every single day. At the same time, we were laughing every single day. We were moving on in life. And we could learn tons from these experiences. But again, man, 